I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'm Steve Smith, and I appreciate the honor of being your chairman. First order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Lieutenant General Retired Keith Huber. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> One of MTSU's traditions that we started when this board started was to recognize an outstanding veteran <clears throat> at our meetings. And General Huber, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Smith, President McPhee, board members, ladies and gentlemen. Today I have the privilege of presenting to you an Army veteran, Chief Warrant Officer for Keith Prather, who has a total of 41 years in service with combined services, 20 years in an active duty status and 21 years in a reserve duty status with two very specific skill sets. First of all, the difficulty of being a public affairs officer and combine that with being a public affairs officer in combat as he was in Iraq. And the second specialty skill set in the legal operations arena to include being a certified mediator and conflict resolution. He has a bachelor's of science degree from Austin P. State University, a master's of science degree from Murray State University, is currently a graduate teaching assistant here at Middle Tennessee State University, pursuing his master's degree in social work. Ladies and gentlemen, CW4 Prather. Thank you, General Huber. Uh, I would like to say good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, to the board, to Dr. Miller and Lieutenant General Huber, and to the rest of the uh, listening audience. I uh, thank them both for welcoming me to MTSU. I uh, started in the spring. I retired two years ago in the DMV. I was in DC area and re decided to uh, come back to school, come back to Tennessee actually, after uh, COVID hit up there and I got laid off. And um, I always had Tennessee on my map being stationed here a long time ago at Fort Campbell and then in Nashville, spending a lot of time in the area. Um, I'm really, uh, I, I knew about MTSU. I always wanted to explore MTSU. I always heard how it was a good school. And uh, so I said, you know what, I'm going to try it. And uh, I applied to several schools in the area, and I got accepted in the social work program here, the grad social work program. And I first met Dr. Harden via phone because it was still COVID going on really strong. And uh, she was very welcoming. I mean, she, was, she made it seamless for me. She, we talked just like we knew one another. And she welcomed me. And... Um, then I came on campus when, uh, in the spring, and I got to go by the Daniel Center, and I met Dr. Miller, and I remember how welcoming she made me feel, and she talked about how veterans were welcome here, and talked to me about the Daniel Center. And then I got to meet uh, General Huber, and uh, I'm with the DAV uh, locally, the local chapter here, and we invited him to learn more about us because he was curious about what the DAV is and what we do. And we did a Zoom and we talked and he was very uh, appreciative of that. Next thing I knew I was throwing out the first pitch at the sounds game because Dr. Miller invited me. She said, hey, can you throw a baseball? I was like, uh, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> it's been a long time, but I did that and represented the school. And, and I, I just realized that this feels like family to me. And so, 
that's where I am right now. I'm enjoying my MSW ex experience. It's, it's very busy. Um, I'm a part of the uh, Student Government Association representing the graduate students. I got to meet Dr. McPhee uh, recently at the 9-11 um, Remembrance. And so I'm just immersed myself into the community and to the life here. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it. So I just want to say um, I consider the Daniel Center a part of my family. I consider being here at MTSU a part of my family. And uh, I am true blue. Thank you. Mr. President, do you have any opening remarks? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let's ask Secretary Floyd, please, to call the roll. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> Trustee Baker. Here. Trustee Boyd. Here. Trustee Cottle. Here. Trustee DeLay. Here. Trustee Freeman. Here. Trustee Jacobs. Here. Trustee Carboia. Here. Chairman Smith. Here. And Trustee Wright. Here. And Trustee Jimenez. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Now's the time to approve our minutes. Has everybody read the minutes? Are there any additions or subtractions or comments? I'd like to have a motion on that. So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Next on our agenda is election of board trustee, chair, and vice chair. Article 5 of the bylaws provide the election of chair and a vice chair. The officers must be elected from among the membership. There are two-year terms, and there's no limit on the terms. Successful nominees will be elected by a majority vote. New officers begin serving immediately. And the floor is now open for nominations for chairman of the board. Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for what a great job you've done at the university. You've been a great advocate of the university. Your commitment's obvious. So um, we thank you for that, and I want to nominate you as chair. I'm flattered. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Are there other or nominees? Mr. Secretary, do we need to um, have a vote, or is that a unanimous deal? You want to have a roll call vote or not? Is that your preference, or uh, what you do uh, by acclamation, or? Uh, would you, is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Made and second to close nominations. So by acclamation, I'm appreciative and looking forward to Two more years of uh, steady making progress. I think our relationship with the president has improved on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day. <laughs> and we're on the edge of, um, of, of a couple of real game changers. So Ms. let's see here. We go next to, uh, are there any for our vice chairman, are there any uh, nominations for vice chair? Mr. Chairman, I'd like uh, first like to say I appreciate the job Trustee Freeman has done and in his role as vice chair. Thank him for that work. But, however, I would like to nominate Trustee Karboyak for the position of vice chair. She is retired as the vice chair of the board of directors of Bridgestone America and has a, has more time to devote to our. MTSU Board of Trust. Her experience, I think, can bring some valuable expertise to the role of vice chair. As she says, she's a recovering attorney, but she also has significant experience in audit and other areas of the form as the former executive officer of Bridgestone Corporation. Finally, I think as we recognized recently, her international knowledge and connections can only benefit the university in the role of vice chair of the board. 
And for these reasons, I nominate Trustee Carboyak for the position as Vice Chair of the MTSU Board of Trust. Is there a second to that? Second motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Are there further nominations? Is, is there a motion to close the nominations? So moved. Is, is, I need a second on that. Second. All in favor of the nominee, say aye. 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 Opposed? That's a unanimous. The next item on our agenda is a rulemaking hearing, and today we consider four rules. The hearing is called to order on Tuesday, September 14, at 110 or 15. I'm Steve Smith, Chairman of the Board, and I'll be conducting the public rulemaking hearing. The hearing is being conducted in the manner set by the Uniform Administration Procedures Act Code, annotated 4. 5204 video that's being recorded is a record of our hearing. The purpose of the hearing is to afford all interested persons an opportunity to present facts, views, arguments relative to the rules. Notice of the hearing on the prescribed form was submitted for publication to the Secretary of State's office. It was emailed to students, faculty, and staff. Information about the hearing was posted on the, posted on the Board of Trustees webpage, and notice was provided to Associated Press, national newspapers, etc. If anyone's interested in making comments during the hearing, there was a sign-up sheet. If you wish to provide comments on rules, please sign the sheet. Pat, were there any? No, sir. Um, are there any signed up for any of the rules? No, sir. Okay. We've made copies of the rules available, and they can be found next to the sign-in sheet. I'd like to ask Jeff Farrar, Associate Counsel, to provide a rule summary. Uh, thank you, Chairman Smith. Um, I'm here to present specifically University Rule 0240-0705, uh, dealing with student conduct. As you know, we have had a long-standing student conduct policy, which is Policy 540, that's approved by this board, has been approved by this board for several years now. And the proposed rule just implements that policy as a formal promulgated rule as required by state law. The proposed rule uh, sets the standards for student conduct, defines the disciplinary offenses, lists available sanctions, and sets the procedures to be used in addressing disciplinary violations, including the availability of hearings and appeals. Um, I'll just also note that there is a parallel rule revision to Policy 540 that will be presented with the Academic Affairs, Student Life, and Athletics Committee report. The revisions that are going to be considered there have already been incorporated into this proposed rule. So upon approval of both the proposed rule and the proposed policy revision, everything will align and be consistent. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there questions from trustees? If there are no questions, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve Rule 0240-0705. So moved. Motion has been made by Mr. DeLay. Trustee DeLay, is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded. Any further discussion? James, I think we ought to get a roll call on this. Yes, sir. And before we proceed to the vote, I would just like to advise the board that I did not receive any comments uh, with regards to this rule. Uh, so you have knowledge of that prior to voting. So with that, I'll call the roll. Trustee Baker. Agree. Trustee Boyd. Approved. Trustee Cottle. Agree. Trustee DeLay. Approved. Trustee Freeman. Approved. Trustee Jacobs. Approved. Trustee Karboyak. Approved. Chairman Smith. Approved. Trustee Wright. Approved. Motion carries. Thank you. Our second rule, 0240-07-07, 
residential life and housing, I'd like to ask Ms. Wade, Assistant University Counsel, to provide a rule summary. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, trustees of the board, President McPhee. Um, I am Sandra Waite, and I am presenting a summary for Rule 02400707 for residential life and housing. Um, this rule will follow the same procedural path that Jeff just outlined for the student conduct uh, rule. And um, just to very quickly go over the salient points of the rule. Um, first, um, I'd like to say that the proposed rule captures the salient aspects of the corresponding residential life and housing policy. Uh, and that framework of the rule tracks largely with the corresponding policy as well. And the rule sets forth our application process, our eligibility standards, uh, rules around termination, cancellation. It also states the university's right to conduct inspections of personal dwelling spaces. It also highlights the distinctions among the types of spaces found within the, re the residential facilities. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or walk through any specific areas of the rule that you'd like to go over in greater detail. Questions from our board? If there are no questions, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve. So moved. moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? James, would you please call the roll? Trustee Baker? Agree. Trustee Boyd? Approve. Trustee Cottle? Agree. Trustee DeLay? Approve. Trustee Freeman? Approve. Trustee Jacobs? Approve. Trustee Carboyak? Approved. Trustee Smith? Approve. Trustee Wright? Approve. Motion carries. Thank you. I think it'd be uh, appropriate to say it was a uni unanimous, I mean, with no dissenting votes or whatever the right terminology you have. Motion to approve 02400707 is concluded. Thank you for everybody. Our third one is Rule 02400706. Title IX compliance. I'd like to ask Jeff to take the mic again and lead us through this. Uh, thank you. And this is um, a revision to a rule that was approved by the board at the last fall board meeting. So fall of 2020, our new Title IX rule was approved and has gone into effect. And this is just a clean up to add one definition in subparagraph four on page 55 of your materials to add the definition of consent that was inadvertently left out of the rule a year ago. That definition is the same as what is currently in our policy and what has been in our policy for quite some time. So. Just that one cleanup revision, we're not changing the definition of anything, just making sure that the rule is all inclusive. Happy to answer any questions. Questions or further discussion? <coughs> Need a motion on this one as well? So moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Is there further discussion or any discussion? James, roll call please. Trustee Baker? Agree. Trustee Boyd? Approved. Trustee Cottle? Agree. Trustee DeLay? Approve. Trustee Freeman? Approved. Trustee Jacobs? Approved. Trustee Karboyak? Approved. Trustee Smith? Approved. And Trustee Wright? Approved. Motion carries unanimously. Motion carries and the hearing on the previous rule is concluded. We have now our fourth <coughs> 0240. 0708 cases heard pursuant to the Uniform Administrative Procedures Act. Mr. Floyd, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Rule number 0240-0708, cases heard pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act. This rule creates a formal version of our existing policy 110 cases heard pursuant to the UAPA. It also incorporates revisions to the policy, uh, which were previously heard before the committee. And in short, uh, the rule reflects that certain that its process does not apply where specific procedures are required by law. For example, such as the new federal Title IX regulations and removal of tenured faculty member for adequate cause, which have their own separate provisions required by law. In addition, this rule includes additional language that the university may use administrative law judges appointed by the Administrative Procedures Division in the, in the conduct, conduct excuse me, of contested cases. Uh, that concludes my summary. Are there any questions of um, Secretary? Need a motion on this one as well. So moved. moved. Motion's been made and a second. Second. James, would you call the roll, please? Trustee Baker. Agree. Trustee Boyd. Approved. Trustee Cottle. Agree. Trustee DeLay. Approved. Trustee Freeman. Approved. Trustee Jacobs. Approved. Trustee Carboia. Approved. Chairman Smith. Approved. And Trustee Wright. Approved. Motion carries. Thank you. Motion carries and the public hearing is, is closed. Record should reflect we had zero requests to appear before us. Now is the time for the committee report, action items, academic affairs, student life, and athletics. Trustee Wright. Thank you, Chairman Smith. The Academic Affairs Student Life and Athletics Committee met on August 24, 2021. <coughs> the committee approved the minutes from its May 25, 2021 meeting. Today, I would like to present four action items for the board's consideration. First, two policy revisions were presented to the committee, Policy 540, Student Conduct, and Policy 541, Residential Life and Housing Policy. Both policies were approved unanimously by this committee. The third item considered by the committee was expedited tenure for two recent hires presented by Provost Burns. The university may find it necessary to expedite tenure review in order to recruit high quality faculty for administrative positions. Departmental input regarding tenure for an administrator is necessary since tenure is awarded in a specific department, Policy 204 Tenure. Associate Professors Comenda Prellis and Tiffany Trent have been reviewed for tenure by their department chairs, department and college committees, and college deans according to MTSU Policy 204 tenure and the respective college and department policies. The president and university provost recommended that tenure be granted effective September 14, 2021. And our committee unanimously approved the recommended expedited tenure be granted. The fourth action item before the committee was a request to appoint Dr. Murat Eric as the chairholder for the Jennings and Rebecca Jones Chair of Excellence in Urban and Regional Planning. MTSU Policy 800 General Personnel requires the approval of the President and the Board of Trustees for appointments of Chairs of Excellence. Dr. Murat Eric, currently the Director of the MTSU Bureau of Economic Research Center, is heavily engaged in work that directly aligns with the objectives of this Chair of Excellence. The committee unanimously approved the appointment of Dr. Eric as chairholder. The only other items before the committee were rule promulgation, which were addressed during the rulemaking hearing. So Mr. Chairman and trustees, some materials outlining the committee's actions were made available for your review prior to this meeting and are contained in your board notebooks and uh, that concludes my report. 
Do I have a motion to approve the report? So moved. Second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Call for a motion. I have. Call for a roll call vote. On this matter, if you so choose, Mr. Chairman, we can just have a voice vote. That'd be great. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, are either of them people here to congratulate? Yes, uh, we have the Chair of the Aviation Department, Dr. Perlis, is here. That's welcome. Next on our agenda is a committee report from Audit and Compliance. Mr. DeLay. Thank you, Chairman Smith. The Audit and Compliance Committee met on August 24th, 2021. The committee approved the minutes from the May 25th, 2021 meeting. Today, I would like to present three action items to the board for consideration. The first action item is a policy revision presented to the committee. Policy 110, cases heard pursuant to the Uniform Administrative Procedures Act. The second action item was approval of the annual report of Audit and Consulting Services. Tennessee Code Annotated 49-14-102, along with the MTSU Board of Trustees bylaws and policy for board committees, requires an annual comprehensive report on the internal audit function be submitted for the committee's review. The report is submitted for the committee's review. MTSU's Policy 70, Internal Audit, Section 7C requires approval of the audit plan by the Audit and Compliance Committee. The internal audit plan for fiscal year 2022 was presented by Ms. Brenda Burkhart. The committee unanimously approved the annual report as presented. The third action item was the request for the approval of the risk assessment reporting. Section 9-18-104 of the Financial Integrity Act requires institutions of higher education to prepare and provide a management assessment of risks to the State of Tennessee's Commissioner of Finance and Administration and to the Comptroller of the Treasury by December 31 annually. For 2021, the Division of Academic Affairs and the Division of, Bu of Business and Finance performed and provided risk assessment reporting. In addition, a risk assessment report was completed detailing university-wide risk and control activities. Similar to MTSU's risk assessment reporting of 2020, the risk assessment documents are, design are excuse me, designated as confidential and are discussed in non-public executive session of the committee. Ms. Janae Stevens presented the risk assessment reports to the committee for approval prior to the report submission to the state as required by law. The only other action items before the committee were rule promulgation which were addressed during the rulemaking hearing. Mr. Chairman and trustees, I'm pleased to report that all action items before this committee were approved unanimously and the materials outlining these actions were made available for your review prior to this meeting and are contained in your board notebooks. Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee DeLay. And we need a motion to approve his report. So moved. Motion, made. motion made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. You get the floor again, you get to take a deep breath. As for a committee report from the Executive and Governance Committee. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Good Smith. Legs. The Executive and Governance Committee met <clears throat> on August 24, 2021. The committee approved the minutes of its May 25, 2021 meeting. Today, I'd like to present three action items for the board's consideration. The first action item considered by the committee was the proposed board policy revision request to address Board of Trustees presented by Mr. James Floyd, University Council and Board Secretary. 
the Board of Trustees adopted and request uh, the request to address Board of Trustees policy at its June 8, 2021 meeting. As part of the meeting discussion, the Board decided to revise the time frame for submission of a request to appear and any proposed written materials from seven days to 14 days in advance of the meeting. This change will allow sufficient time after receipt of the request to have the item included on the meeting agenda prior to publication. The second action item was proposed board bylaw revision also presented by Mr. Floyd. The Board of Trustees bylaws, Article 10, states that bylaws may be modified by amendment at any regular meeting by two-thirds vote of the Board of Trustees. The following amendments were presented. Article 6, officers of the board is submitted to reflect po uh, position title change from Director of Audit and Consulting Services to Chief Audit Executive. Article 8, meeting of the board, is amended to align the timing for requests to address the Board of Trustees with the publication of the board meeting agenda. This will allow sufficient time after receipt of a request to have the item included in the meeting agenda prior to publication before requiring requests <clears throat> to be submitted 14 days instead of the current seven in advance of the meeting, along with any proposed written materials. The next action item before the committee was review and approval of the 2021 self-evaluation instrument. Mr. Floyd reminded us that MTSU's accreditation body, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, SACSCOC, requires a governing board to define and regularly evaluate its responsibilities and expectations under standard 4.2G. As evidence of compliance with this standard, Saxcock recommends a regular board self-evaluation. The Executive <clears throat> Governance Committee is responsible for overseeing the performance of the Board of Trustees and, as such, is charged with preparation of the board's self-evaluation procedures and instrument. The last action item before the committee, and also presented by Mr. Floyd, was authorization to conduct board self-evaluation prior to November 2021 Board of Trustees meeting and adoption of recurring schedule. The Executive and Governance Committee is charged with implementation of the regular cycle of board self-evaluation. The committee will direct board secretary to administer the self-evaluation survey over a specified period compile responses received, and report results to the board chair. At its May 2021 meeting, the Executive and Governance Committee revised the board's policy on board committees for compliance with Saxcock Standard 4.2G board self-evaluation. The committee is required to adopt a regular schedule for evaluations of the board's responsibilities and expectations on at least a biennial basis. This action will establish a documented cycle of evaluation and continuous improvement of the, for the Board of Trustees. Finally, there was one information item, discussion of the 2019 self-evaluation results, action for improvement. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and Trustees, I'm a pleased to report, I am pleased to report that all action items before this committee were approved and the materials outlining these actions were made available for your review prior to this meeting and are contained in your board notebooks. Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee DeLay. We need a motion to approve the committee's report. I'll move. Motion has been second. made. Is there a second? Second. And seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> this particular uh, approval requires a roll call vote. <laughs> okay. Just Thank you. Thank bylaws. you for the correction. I apologize. No, no, that's good. Thank you. Call the roll, please, James.
Uh, Trustee Baker? Agree. Trustee Boyd? Approve. Trustee Cottle? Approve. Trustee DeLay? Approve. Trustee Freeman? Approve. Trustee Jacobs? Approve. Trustee Carboyer? Approved. Chairman Smith? Approved. Trustee Wright? Approved. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Next is a committee report from Finance and Personnel, Trustee Jacobs. Thank you, Chairman Smith. The Finance and Personnel Committee met on August 24th, 2021. The committee approved the minutes from its May 25th, 2021 meeting. Today, I would like to present three action items for the board's consideration. The first item before the committee was a request for approval of the permanent appointment of assistant to the president for institutional equity and Title IX coordinator. Policy 808, compensation reporting and approvals, requires the appointment and salary recommendation of vice presidents or, or other executives reporting directly to the president to be approved by the Board of Trustees. President McPhee has recommended that Ms. Christy Ziegler be permanently appointed as the assistant to the president for institutional equity and compliance slash Title IX and Title VI coordinator at a salary of $110,000. The second item before the committee was consideration of approval for our capital outlay request submittal. As part of the annual capital budget request process, institutions for higher education must submit their capital outlay project request for state funding to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. The commission ranks these projects requests and issues project selection recommendations to the governor of Tennessee. For fiscal year 2022-2023, THEC, as required that requests be made for renovation projects only. The proposed MTSU capital outlay request for fiscal year 2022-2023 is the renovations of Kursky, Old Main, and Rutledge Hall project. This approximately $52 million project seeks to carry out extensive renovations to these buildings including replacement of major building systems, exterior repairs, window replacement, and replanning to ensure these buildings will, be, will provide modern space for academic instructions for many years to come. In addition, THEC notified the university on August the 11th that a second capital outlay project could be <coughs> submitted this year for funding. The submittal could be either a new building or another renovation project and would be due by October 15th. Per THEC, this request should directly support workforce development and or community outreach. MTSU plans to submit a second capital outlay proposal for new facilities associated with the programs in our aerospace department, professional pilot, maintenance management, flight dispatch, dispatch, aviation technology, and aviation management programs. Project constructions would include two hangars, one for maintenance management and one for, for professional pilot, along with building space for pilot briefing rooms, flight dispatch, classrooms, class labs, offices, and support space. The next item before the committee was a request to extend the current debt service fee on the stadium expansion project beyond the maturity date of 2027-28. This extension would provide a revenue source on the Student Athletic Performance Center project in conjunction with revenue generated by the athletic capital fee. The debt service fee related to the stadium expansion project is $45 per credit hour with the athletic capital fee set at $40. Annual combined revenue generated from both fees is approximately 3.2 million annually and would provide most of the funding needed to repay 61 million in borrowing over a 30 year term. The fourth item before the committee was consideration of approval for a change in the corporate rate. 
While the cor corporate rate is currently tied to the in-state tuition rate, there is no incentive for corporations wanting to send their employees that mainly operate in the state of Tennessee. The proposed modification is to set the rate at an 18% discount off the undergraduate and graduate in-state tuition rates. This would set the corporate rate at approximately $250 for undergraduate students and $428 for graduate students, effective with the 2021-22 academic year. These rates would autom adjust automatically when the board approved future increases in the university tuition rates. And finally, the last action item before the committee was approval of salary increases. Policy 808, compensation reporting and approval requires the Board of Trustees to approve salary increases of MTSU employees. The university is receiving 4.5 million in appropriations this fiscal year to implement salary increases. This represents about 55 to 60% of funding needed for our 2% salary pool effective January 1st, 2021, and a 2% salary pool effective July 1, 2021. The proposed recommendation is to use this funding to provide a 2.7% across the board increase for all employees or a $750 minimum increase, whichever is greater. One informational item was presented. Kathy Mosselman, Assistant Vice President for Human, for Human Resources, presented the Classified Employee Grievance, Grievance Annual Report as required by 49-8-117 that each state university board shall provide an annual report to the Education Committee of the Senate and the Education Committee of the House of Representatives summarizing grievance activities of the previous year. The report contained one grievance for fiscal year July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2020. Mr. Chairman and Trustees, I am pleased to report that all action items before this committee were approved and the materials outlining these actions were made available for your review to this meeting, prior to this meeting, and are contained in your board book notebooks. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. You could use a Gatorade after that. Yes, I can. <laughs> we need a <clears throat> vote for, on the items from the Finance Personnel Committee, so I need so, a motion. So moved. I have a second? Second. Uh, Motion's been made and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion unanimously carries. Next on our agenda is a presentation by Vice Chair Freeman. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Smith. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Chairman Boyd, thank you for the kind words you said about me sure. uh, thank earlier, you for your in service. This, earlier in your remarks. Uh, my father, who had a ninth grade education, and my mom, who did not graduate from high school, would have, they would have known if you were who you were talking about. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, that. Uh, in our committee meetings uh, two weeks ago, uh, I had some questions that I didn't get a chance to ask. And uh, so I wanted to do that today, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay with you all. Um, and my, my questions uh, are around uh, en enrollment and uh, diversity and the environment that we have here on campus. <clears throat> but before I go there, let me thank this board for allowing me to be the vice chair for four years. It's been a cool honor to do that. When I came to MTSU a number of years ago, I would have never dreamed, well, first I didn't dream, dream of graduating. So to become the vice chair it's pretty awesome, uh, particularly uh, from where I grew up and how I grew up. So thank you all for the honor to be the vice chair. <clears throat> As a business person, I look at a lot of numbers. And some of you know that in the last couple of weeks, we sold our bank and I've been looking at numbers for about 18 months as, we relate, as it relates to that. A question that I have for the board is, MTSU used to be 
the largest undergraduate institution in the state. We had 26,654 students. Today, 2020, we have roughly about 22,000. And my question to Mr. President and team, what are we gonna do to reverse that trend? What are we gonna do to get MTSU growing again? It's been a steady, it's, it was a decline and then we plateaued and I think this year's enrollment may be down again, but I'm, I'm not certain about that. But we've gone from 26,654 students down to 22,175. And so my question is, what are we gonna do about that? How are, we gonna, how are we gonna change that trend and get it going back in the right direction? That's my first question, and I have several questions. Why, why don't we, you give us all the questions and we'll address them at one time. Versus you want all questions? the questions? Well, okay, please. sure. Yeah. It, you and know, so, a board meeting isn't necessarily the place to have a question and answer period. I, I know, but, I, okay. but at my previous meeting. And you've been allotted 20 minutes on the. On my, the, the previous meeting, meeting, I asked, could I ask questions, and I was told I could not. So go, go right so, ahead, but let's do them all. You make, you're making a note, Mr. President? Yes. Let's, let's do them all uh, at one time, and we'll try to handle all the answers at once. And so declining enrollment, MTSU is not the number one, the largest undergraduate institution in the state of Tennessee. Actually, we're on the decline. Uh, secondly, and my question is, what are, what are we going to do about the decline? And then secondly, of the... 4,000 plus students, uh, 4,000 plus decline, uh, roughly 40% uh, of those are African Americans. So what I, what I mean by that is our African American enrollment has gone from 4,717. Now these are, these are not, these are, stu these are schools numbers. Uh, this is, I mean, this is our report card. We've gone from 4,717 African Americans down to 2850. And my question is, what is it about this place? What is it about this place where we have a declining enrollment of African Americans? What is it about this place that we're going to change that's going to make that enrollment turn around and go uh, in a different direction? My next question is this. <clears throat> MTSU, we sit in one of the fastest growing counties in the country. We sit in one of the fastest growing counties in the country, Mr. Chairman. And we got declining enrollment. We got declining enrollment. While if you look at the numbers, if you look at the numbers over the past several years, MTSU's declining enrollment over the past year, ten, year, 10 years has been the highest of all the LGIs. It's been the highest of all the LGIs, and I'll give them to you. Declining enrollment, 16.8%. Is there a question, or, yeah. or are we just... Mr. It, Chairman, it, if you're going to let me talk, let me talk. I well, mean, I'm not going to just let you talk. You said I had 20 <clears throat> minutes. Go for it. I mean... I'm describing a problem Thank you. and using, your, using our numbers that we, <clears throat> MTSU over the past 10 years, 16% decline, TSU, 14%, TTU, 11%, and it goes down. And so we got the largest decline, but I'm trying to figure out why is it that we have the largest decline, and we're located in one of the fastest growing counties in the state of Tennessee, in the, in the country. And my next question is for Alan, our finance person. What does that mean when we don't have 4,000 students that we had before? What does that mean for us financially? How does that impact our budget? How does that impact the number of faculty members we have? How does, that impact the, the, how does that impact the number of people that are at the football games? How does that impact athletics? We got a 4,000 student deficit from, from a high. 
And it's not just, it's not just African American students that it's on a decline. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the areas, Mr. Chairman, that you focus on a great deal is veterans. Our number of veteran students is on a, on a decline. We had 764 veterans in fall of 2018, and now we're down to 649. So what is it, how are we gonna change, how are we gonna turn this around? Dr. McPhee recently sent me a note that said that MTSU has the most, it's the most diverse campus, has most diverse it's ever had. The most diverse campus, and what does that mean? Was that a goal to become the most diverse, for us, our campus to be the most diverse today than it's ever been? Because the campus has shrunk. The enrollment has gotten smaller. So what does it mean to be the most diverse if the enrollment continues to decline at the greatest rate among African Americans? Then my next question is this. Since we compete with a number of other universities, UT, and a host of others. UT had record freshman enrollment this year. They had record freshman enrollment this year. 5,900 students. 18% of those were first generation. 19% were people of color. 19% were people of color. And so, being a competitor, I listened to the UT board meetings. And I listened to Randy Boyd and his vice chair, I mean his chairman. His chairman said, I want to go bold on diversity. That's what he said. He said he wanted to go bold on diversity. We want to do something bold. Randy Boyd, who's been the chairman there, been the CEO there uh, for three years, within the first month, of getting to the campus, he opened an office of diversity and hired a VP, a chancellor for diversity in that office. Then he went to every school, School of Education, School of Engineering, and said, we got to have a diversity officer in every school. They have decided to go bold on diversity, to go bold. We don't have a chief diversity officer. We don't have a office of diversity. And our numbers are on the, for African Americans, people of color is on the decline. UT has gone bold on diversity. And then another thing in listening to their meetings, their meetings last from 10 to 12, lunch, one to three. They have open, deliberate, convers co deliberate conversations about tough topics. And the, the chairman, is the former CEO of PepsiCo, and one of the members of the board is the CEO of AutoZone, they have a business meeting where they talk openly about what their problems are and what, how to come up with solutions. They do that. And one of the things that caught my attention, and JB, you may know a little bit more about this than I do. Several years ago, they started talking about these, there was gonna be a squeeze on enrollment in Tennessee number of graduate, Tennessee graduates, and, and the, the fight for, to, get, to get students from all the high schools. And they said, you know, we may have to be acquisitive. We may have to buy some schools. Now, this, this past May, last May, Randy Boyd went to Martin Methodist. I think you were on the board there, JB, for 10 years. 24. You were on the board for 24 years. Yes, sir. Okay. Randy Boyd drove to Martin Methodist and had coffee with the president of Martin Methodist and talked about a partnership. Long story short, some months later, they come up with a letter of intent for Martin Methodist to become a part of the UT system. 
we, this board, we sent out a note to fight it, to, to, to say that we're, we're, you know, we're not really against it. I got the press release right here. That we're, that we're not really for it, that they should be a part of our system, et cetera, et cetera. And so I listened to the ceremony when they finished the deal, Pete. And Randy Boyd said all it took was him having coffee and talking about a partnership that made that deal happen. And then <clears throat> he thanked the governor because he called the governor in May of last year and thanked him to ask him about the transaction. And the governor loved the transaction, liked the transaction, said he liked it three times. The governor said he liked it, he liked it, he liked it. So when Randy Boyd finished speaking, he brought the governor up. The governor said that this transaction is one of, it's going to go down in Tennessee's history, it's one of the greatest activities of all time. And then he said, it wouldn't have happened without the leadership and vision of Randy Boyd. So what did UT get? They got a place in our backyard. They got a place 75 miles from here, JB. They picked up 800 students, and they've, and they've said they're going to double the size. They picked up $32 million in real estate. The state paid UT $5 million, gave them, gave them $5 million to help underwrite the tuition at uh, Martin Methodist to, to bring it down to state level tuition. And they say they're going to double the size of the students. My point is this. I, I, hopefully we are, somebody is talking about acquiring schools in this room. Because I personally went and met with Randy Boyd. And I said, Randy, you just started something by buying a school. And he said, I'm gonna, we're going to digest this one. And that's all he said. My point is, if we're going to grow, we may have to, it may not be through traditional growth, Joey. It may be that we got to go acquire somebody, acquire some, some students. And so, and then <clears throat> what I wanted to do at the last meeting, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to do, but I, I want to do it today. When I was a student here. Is there a question on the list? Yes, there's a question. It's going to be a motion, actually. It's going to be what? It's going to be a motion. Thank you. So when I was a, school, a student here, I had to walk past two places where Nathan Bedford Forrest existed. Nathan Bedford Forrest is the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a slave owner. I had to walk past that building and every now and then go in it. I had to walk past the plaque on the wall of the KUC. Now, I don't want to see any more students on this campus have to go into a classroom with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan on it. There, was, there have been students, black and white, to come speak to this board about the Nathan Bedford Forest building. We didn't listen. We didn't listen. And Dr. McPhee, in the information that you provided me, that we, we, we went to THEC, to, to the Tennessee, the committee, to talk about getting the name changed. But I don't think the board has weighed in on the name change of this building. I don't think we've weighed in on that had very limited conversations about it. So I'm going to conclude my remarks. And Mr. Chairman, if it's OK with you when Dr. McPhee talks, we can, he and I can talk back and forth. I'm, I can do that. But I want to make a motion that the board is in support of removing the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest from the ROTC building. That's my motion, that we're in support of it. Darrell, uh, the reason you weren't 
given more time than the others, you hadn't asked to be on the agenda. If you had asked to be on Chairman Wright's agenda, all these items could have been. So far in our board meetings for four years, we haven't taken a motion that hasn't come through and been debated and uh, vetted by the appropriate committee. Now, Mr. Secretary, I don't know if it's out of order or not. I'm not suggesting it is or it isn't, but it is different than of the last four years. Do you have a, do you opine on that subject or not? Just one moment. Nothing like putting you on the spot, I understand. No, that's not like a good, nothing like a good motion on, <laughs> on the table. <laughs> well, you have to have a second for a discussion. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I get it. And if we don't want to have a, I get it. There's a motion that we get that the board is in support. I've, we've got your motion. Oh, okay, good. I just want to make sure they got it. He's got it. Okay. Now, our bylaws provide that matters not appearing on the agenda of a stated meeting may be considered only upon an affirmative vote of majority of those present and voting. So before consideration, um, there would have to be a motion to consider by the majority. And then the substance of the matter can be addressed from there. Do we have a motion to consider uh, an agenda, a action that's not approved by a committee or on the agenda? And if I misspoke there, please correct me. I'm, I'm, I don't have, a, I'm not professing an expertise in this. I just. Uh, so in the spirit of open dialogue, I'll, I'll move, I'll make that motion. Second. So the motion has been made and seconded to? Consider the issue. To consider the issue. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. <clears throat> all right, there's been a motion made. Is there a second to that motion? Well, oh. yeah. I'm waiting for discussion, I'm sorry. So do we need a second in order to get to the I discussion point? I think we point? need a second before we get discussion. Yeah. I agree with it's that. It's my understanding. I that would be correct. Yeah. So I'll make a, I'll second. You'll second the motion and it's wide open for discussion. Can I start from a student perspective? Of course. Um, I've spoken with Dr. McPhee about this. Um, I recently attended Presidium, which is a leadership retreat for all of the um, campus organization leaders. Um, most of the people there are informed about the processes that have to take place in order to make this kind of change happen. Um, but the subject was brought up uh, to the student council president, who is also in support um, of this change. And right then and there, someone said, if I were to start a petition from student leaders on campus to restart the process, um, to reach out to our leaders on campus, including the board, office of the president, um, to get this change to happen, who would be in favor of that? Which, you know, which leaders on campus think that this is something that needs to happen right now? And I mean, I didn't, nobody did a head count, but looking around the room, every student leader on campus, almost, had their hand raised and raised it quickly. I think this is one of the easiest things um, to address um, Mr. Freeman's first question. This is one of the easiest things that the board can do um, to make this a better environment for prospective um, students of color, other marginalized students, because we know that when it's a hostile environment for one group of marginalized students, other groups feel that. Um, and that kind of attitude extends. So I think this is one of the easiest things that the board can do to step in in favor of the students um, and just show that we're, we have this attitude of increasing enrollment and at least making the statement that we, we want more students of color at MTSU and we want students of color at MTSU to feel comfortable, to feel safe, to feel respected. Thank, thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I add to Gabriella's comment from a faculty perspective? 
I know that over the past four years on my time with faculty senate, this comes this has come up several times. Um, and each time it comes up from entire faculty senate, it is unanimous that that has to change. And we understand, and I'm sure students understand that there's a frustration level with once it gets to the state. And I, I can uh, speak from experience that the university has done everything they could to get that name changed um, and gotten blocked several times. But I do think it's a good idea that we lay this down as a board of trustees and say, this has got to change on this campus. That, that one name will be one step towards changing. So from a faculty standpoint, faculty would be, uh, I would be surprised if it were not unanimous. Thank you. So can I just make a comment? I think it's, you, you raised a very important point, and that is that the university has in the past made um, a lot of effort in order to change the name. Due to circumstances beyond the control of the university, that was not possible. The tenor at the state, I believe, has modified itself some to a certain extent. And so uh, if, the, if the motion is, does this board support the administration to make additional efforts given the change in circumstances at the state to um, re reignite this issue of changing the name on the ROTC building, um, then that to me is something that I think we can, we can, we can pose. I just wanna make sure that we're clear about what we're asking for because unilaterally, I think this is the point that uh, Gabriella made that you made, is that you can't do it by yourself. You need to go through the process. And so what I'm, what I wanna make sure that I understand is exactly what it is that the motion is requesting of this board so I that can we're explain. clear. Okay. It's very simple. I made the motion that the board supports removing the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest from the building. Okay. We support it. Now, whether or not we can go do it, whether or not it. it can make it happen, but that we support it. Got it. And the reason why, there's, there's, there's thousands of reasons why we don't need the name of a Ku Klux Klansman on our building. MTSU is recruiting a, a friend of mine's son to play football. And he said no. Y'all got, got a building named after a Klansman. In 2021, y'all got a building named after a guy who would buy and sell my son. And you want him to come, let me, let me finish, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Come on, guys. I mean, I serve on a lot of corporate boards. I just ask for some respect. Do you think a corporate board chairman yes. would allow this kind of? Of course, I'm a corporate board chairman. Of course, I would allow, I would allow, I would allow, as, I would allow as much dialogue as possible so that smart people that are sitting around this room Smart people sitting around this room can engage in the conversation. This school has a declining enrollment. I think we've and so, heard, I think we've so heard let me that. finish. Let me finish, Mr. Chairman. We have, got, we have got to, as a board, we've got to tackle our tough problems. We've got to engage as a board to tackle our tough problems. We've got problems. We got a lot of press, press releases up, enrollment down. We know how to get press, but our enrollment is down. And so my motion is what I said, that the board is in support of removing Nathan Bedford Forrest's name from the ROTC building. But let's, and if, let's further discussion. I'm in favor of the okay. motion, but I, I think it's clear where you stand. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. So, Mr. Mr. Floyd, can, is it possible to call the question on this and put it to a vote? We have and, it, Whether we support it or not? Oh, okay. I'd, I'd like the chair's to, discretion. I'd like to, to, set the chair. to okay. ask anybody that has a question to bring it forward, but in time. I, 
Mr. Chairman and Dr. McPhee, just I know Dr. McPhee and you have been working on this for years uh -huh. and continue to work on it con and working on it now. Does the this help the political efforts to get this done? I think everybody's in favor of getting it done, but we don't want to do anything to hurt it either. So I would right. like you and Dr. McPhee just to speak to that. I'd like to, to give that. Dr. McPhee a, a 90 seconds yeah. is all. I wrote an ed editorial opinion piece at the Tennessee on August 10th, stating the position of the university very clearly. Uh, almost a year and a half, two years ago, the chairman and I visit top state officials mm -hmm. with regards to the university's interest in removing that name at the executive level and also at the legislative level. We all know that the his uh, Tennessee Historical Commission has been reconstituted. We were told that that was going to happen. And I have made it very clear that it is the intent of the university, my recommendation, to continue to recommend removing that. And at the appropriate time, we will make that um, recommendation. And we were told by state officials that they would let us know when it's time to do that. So, so, so President McPhee, what I'm hearing you say is that it, to Tom's question, it's not, it would not hinder the process and could in fact be very supportive of the process to show that the administration has the support of the independent board of trustees. Yes, that's correct. I concur, I concur both with removing and uh, this, this uh, certainly can't hinder. So the question's been called for. All in favor say aye. 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 Is there opposition? It's a unanimous vote. Okay. So your time's up. Do you have any more questions? And he, I just, he's, he's prepared to yeah, answer I, them. Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, again, appreciate the board allowing me to mm. serve as vice chair for a number of years. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great honor. Uh, <clears throat> I think the board, if we would just, just take a look at what some of our competitors are doing in this space and get more informed because it's a competitive marketplace out there. And uh, with our declining enrollment, I don't know what the update is for the fall, but with our declining enrollment, uh, we've got to figure out a way to turn this thing around. It, it's a, it's we got to figure out a way to turn it around. Thank you. Thanks for your service. Yes, sir. Won't you? How long? Yes. Does it take? Um, I would like to respond to two of his Please. issues before I get into my report. Good. And the first is enrollment. We have made a strategic decision ten years ago to reduce our enrollment. We made the decision to support the development of Motlo Community College. Before I came president, we were offering remedial courses, teaching ninth grade and eighth grade English and math. And as we put the goal to become a top comprehensive university, we made a decision to dismantle the remedial program, give it to the community colleges, and develop a partnership with the community college for transfer students. As a result of that, you can see, and in a moment in my report, you will see what the results are in terms of the university's recommendations. Secondly, we have raised our admission standard twice uh, during my tenure. We have made it very clear, and in fact, a point of correction to Vice Chairman Cummings, the university has not been on a consecutive decline in its enrollment. Prior to the pandemic, we've actually had a significant increase in enrollment. Our freshman class was at 2018, Dr. Sells, or 2019, we had a 15% in the increase in the first time freshman class. And what we also saw was the ACT, the average ACT score has gone up significantly. That has resulted in our overall uh, graduation rate going up. We produce 
the largest number of under undergraduates degree next to the University of Tennessee, f four to 5,000 a year. We also have put in place, and this year every single LGI had a decrease in the enrollment as a result, certainly, of the pandemic. And prior to this year, we did not have a decrease in our enrollment. So we can also, at the appropriate time, have Dr. Sells, perhaps at another meeting, Mr. Chairman, uh, talk about the efforts and the additional work that they have put in place to keep the university's enrollment at a level where we actually put as 23, 20 to the 23,000 students. We were enrolling and going up like seven or eight percent. The state was not funding us, and we made the decision to cap our enrollment by three percent in order to focus on quality rather than quantity. That was a strategic decision of the university. And so at the appropriate time, I think, uh, to the second question in terms of what we're doing, we're not sitting around trying to figure out or twiddling <coughs> our thumbs. The board just approved a corporate rate that we develop in working with corporation to have uh, their employees, that partnership with MTSU, and just this year we started a pilot program with the uh, McDonald Corporation, he owns 12 McDonald's. We, in just a few weeks, we had close to 100 students enrolled, and it's a new program. And so uh, I just don't want the impression to be left that somehow, one, the university has been on a perpetual decline, two, that the university is not doing anything, Strategically, it was the university decision to cap its enrollment, we raise admission standards twice, and in a moment when I give you my report, you will see some of the results. Dr. Okay. McPhee, can I ask a question? And this might be part of your report. Sure. Um, tell me if it is. So when you were talking about focusing on quality over quantity, besides the increased ACT scores that you mentioned, what are some other concrete like statistical markers of that quality? that we could compare to other LGIs to see how we're doing, you know, if that quality over quantity is being successful as a competitor of other LGIs. Two other metrics, number of students that are graduating and the increase in the graduation rates of the university. So, so Mr. Chairman. Cindy, uh, sorry, Professor, or um, President McPhee, just one other point that I just, I, this is not relevant to undergraduate um, acquisition of students, for lack of a better term, but I do recall that there was significant effort made by the university to expand um, a law school. That's correct. And unfortunately, due to state approval processes, that enrollment increase was not approved as well. That's correct. So um, just in order to be level setting, I think that it would be helpful just to remember some of the the past activities um, that have also been previously yeah. mentioned. Just to, just to kind of put that Thank up. Thank you right. for reminding me about that. And one last item on the issue of enrollment. We have begun about a year ago to build our online operation. We hired a chief online officer, and we hope to see some results in that. So, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to give my report, um, well, President's report. report Mr. President. As I've said before, I always appreciate the opportunity uh, to update the board on matters of importance of the university since our last meeting. Today, however, please allow me to deviate from my usual report in order to reflect on a personal milestone. For the past 20 years, I've been honored and blessed to serve this outstanding university as its president. In today's world of rapid changes in academia, where presidential tenure averaged less than 7.5 years, my tenure is unique, and at the same time, it is a remarkable testament of the exceptional Blue Raider family we have here in Murfreesboro and around the state. Since August of 2001, 
It has been my pleasure to serve with some of the most dedicated and incredibly talented faculty, staff, and administrators who have helped build this institution to a respected, nationally ranked institution. Now, while we should take great pride in the progress that has been made during my tenure, we must also acknowledge that there's much work left to be done and challenges to address as we continue to pursue the mission and the goals of the university. So please indulge me for a few moments to reflect on some of the selected highlights that the faculty, staff, and administrators have, have achieved and accomplished uh, during the past 20 years. As board members, you along with employees, students, and our thousands of alums have much to be proud of regarding the university's accomplishment over the years, including the following. First, in a world that thrives on competitions and rankings, we have elevated the status of the university in many areas and have achieved a number of national recognition. For example, in 2009, the prestigious Forbes magazine national ranking <coughs> ranked MTSU as the 47th best academic university in the nation and the 57th most affordable university. More recently, the Princeton Review, one of America's most respected college guides, for the second year in a row, selected MTSU as one of the best colleges in America, ranking us in the 2020 and 2021 ranking. Only 300 of the 5,000 institutions made that list. Only four universities in Tennessee were included in the top rankings. MTSU was one of those public universities, along with two private universities, Vanderbilt and Rhodes College. Other national rankings were earned by the US News and World Report, among others, and our Jennings A. Jones College of Business the College of Media and Entertainment, the College of Health and Behavioral Health and Sciences have had significant recognition of a number of their academic programs being ranked some of the best in the nation. Now, ranking and recognitions are certainly important as they reflect on the quality of our efforts, but institutional excellence is ultimately about the success of our students and it is here at MTSU where we shine. During my tenure, the university has raised admission standards twice in order to recruit and enroll more high ability students. And in 2015, the annual enrollment was capped at 3%. Early in my tenure, the university made a strategic decision, as I mentioned earlier, to eliminate the offering of remedial and developmental courses and the department. And in fact, I got a lot of pushback from that. Even letters were sent to the governor uh, in opposed to my, uh, the university's decision in that area. Our goal was to focus on quality. And as I said, not quantity. And I gave you some of the metrics that we uh, look at in terms of measuring. For the first time in the institution history in 2004, we recruited and enrolled, ladies and gentlemen, first time in 2004, national merit scholars, national achievement scholars, and national Hispanic scholars that helped to raise the academic status of the university. In 2001, private funds in excess of $2 million was raised in less than 24 months during my very first year here to build a state first honors building, the Paul Martin Senior Honors College. The private funds were matched for a total of $5 million for the project. And in 2004, the university's most prestigious academic scholarship was awarded. It's the Buchanan Fellowship in honor of our alumnus, Dr. James Buchanan. Dr. Buchanan left 
his estate valued at $4 million to the university, which provided funding for this student scholarship support and in numerous activities. We attract now students in that program for that scholarship who turned down Ivy League schools to come to MTSU. And here's another great accomplishment from our university and the Honors College. In 2015, Ms. Tandra Martin was the institution's first and only Rhodes Scholar finalist. Tandra is an African-American student who graduated from Oakland High School and earned her degree here in international relations. In 2015, the university established a center to provide support for student vet veterans and their families. It is the largest, most comprehensive veteran service center in the nation. And of course, the center is named in honor of our friend and benefactor, Charlie and Hazel Daniels, and it has received national recognition for its service. Now, with regards to graduation rates, at an institution that is dedicated to serving the demographic of students, representing the true diversity of our state, our overall six-year graduation rate has significantly increased over the past 10 years. And we have been recognized nationally for our student success by APLU, which is the uh, nation top public organization for university, state universities, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Chronicle of Higher Education, just to name a few. I have previously shared with you an informational package with a summary of selective data on the academic progress of our students. And the data shows that today, indeed, percentage-wise, that the campus has enrolled more students, more students of color in the history of the university. That is a fact. We are proud to be the university of choice for first-generation veterans and military families and those that are economically challenged, Pell eligible, and low income. In addition, TX data report that MTSU maintains the third highest six-year graduation among state universities institution, only behind UT Knoxville, which is a large flagship institution, and Tennessee Tech and Engineering School. Your data packet, once you take a look at that, and I'll be giving that to you at the end of this presentation, also noted some of the success and identify areas that we need improvement as we work towards increasing our graduation rates and closing the achievement gap. Now, recording academics, regarding academic programs accomplishment. During the past 20 years, the university has added over 40 degree programs, two institutions, and 20 centers. And over the past two decades, we have significantly increased our offerings of advanced academic degrees program. When I arrived at the university, the university had no PhD programs, zero PhD programs, and just a few master's degree. Today, I'm pleased to report that our university now offers eight PhD programs with 13 program concentration, one doctor of education degree, eight education specialist degree, and 38 master's degree with numerous concentration. And what we have seen the results, you had the dean of the graduate school at a committee meeting came and talk about the increase in graduate students. We had the lowest number of graduate programs compared with all the other universities, which did not allow us to recruit graduate students until we added some of these programs. And we still are at the bottom in the terms of the number of programs. In fact, the university was held back from offering graduate programs and some were taken from us because of the Guy lawsuit that involved Tennessee State. This is the history, this is the context in which the university has been operating. The creation of these PhDs has resulted in the university earning the National Carnegie designation as a major 
comprehensive research university. Prior to that, we were at the master's level. Our success has required the investment and support of our alumni and friends, an area where we were well behind our peers for many years. In the areas of development and fundraising, a major capital campaign was launched in 2010 that raised a record $107 million as part of our 100 year anniversary. In spite of major national recession, we did this during the recession, 0809 recession, and local issues that impacted many of our donors and friends. This was the most successful campaign in the history of the university and was co-chaired by our own trustee, Pam Wright. We have elevated our annual fundraising from two to three million dollars a year prior to my arrival to a sustained level of 10 to 12 million per year. And Joe Bales and his staff are to be given a great deal of uh, compliments and recognition for this. This level of support has elevated us to the top 25 of our national peers, institutions like MTSU. Now, with respect to expanding campus facilities and improving our campus infrastructure, during the past 20 years, new construction and, innovation and renovation of projects total $1.3 billion with support of private and state funds. And I'm pleased to note that each of these projects have been completed on time and within budget. Now, it's often stated that your athletic department and your athletic program is the front door to the institution, and I fully agree. Intercollegiate athletics is a vital part of the university's experience and should reflect the overall quality of the institution. Now, while wins on the court and the playing field are often visible measures of success, they only tell one part of the story. After a challenging period early in my tenure regarding the academic performance of our student athletes, we made significant changes in our operation and now enjoy sustained success in the academic progress of our student athletes, ranking as one of the top academic performers in the United States of America, the NCA. Additionally, we have and continue to win conference championship in two different athletic conferences over the past 20 years, with six conferences and a national championship crown just last year. These present only a few members of the board of the many successes we have enjoyed. However, in the interest of time, I've limited the list of the highlights to only a few of those achievements during this period. Now, of course, we are all pleased with our success. However, we recognize there are a number of areas where the university needs to continue to pursue improvement. And while we have made measurable progress in our overall graduation rates, we need to continue that work and work towards increasing the rates for all of our students, all of our students, especially our Pell eligible, low income and first generation students. And I'm pleased that the board in a recent meeting endorsed the strategic goal of the university to increase our six year graduation from 53% to 60% within the next five years. Our faculty and staff have already begun efforts to assure to, that we meet that most important goal. Another area of focus is improvement in the state income outcome formula, the metrics. And I've talked to each of you about that and how it disadvantaged the university. To achieve this, we must continue our efforts to assure that the evaluation metrics are reflective of the uniqueness of each institution that our campus action support and continuous improvement. The salary compensation of our employees remains significantly low below our peers and needs to be addressed. And if we were to effectively recruit the level of talent for our institution that it deserves, it is becoming a morale problem. 
Now, while a recent increase in state appropriation have offered some promise, more than three decades of decreasing state support has left the university operating budget in dire need of improvement. Many years ago, nearly 70% of the cost of higher education was supported by the state. Today, that is less than 30%. Years of budget cuts and forced reallocation have put the strain on the university and our ability to serve our students and our audience. So it's important that we continue to improve the outreach to a larger community, eliminating the tongue and, and gown barriers that have affected higher education across the country. And we will work toward greater engagement of our community and aggressively pursue partnership with various sectors of the community. We will make our campus more open and welcoming, encouraging greater participation in campus events, such as theater, musical performances, academic and athletic events. And certainly, members of the board, as a microcosm of our larger society, our university is faced with some issues of race relations, just like all the other campuses in the nation. With increased concern regarding about our campus climate environment being expressed by some of our students and employees. And I've mentioned to this board about committees that I've put together. Uh, we are in the process now of hiring a, a senior executive uh, for uh, inclusion and diversity uh, for the institution that, that uh, ad is out uh, as we speak. We will continue to confront and address these issues as a community, as a campus community. It should go without saying that the ROTC building was named for Nathan Bedford Forrest. And we've heard and have discussed that. And I don't need to repeat this part of my notes because I've told you that my commitment, my efforts that I've made over the years to remove that name, it stands for itself and needs no further um, explanation. Now, our most recent challenge, and perhaps the greatest, in the 110-year history of our university, began in March 2020, with the onset of the unprecedented worldwide pandemic, COVID-19. And it continues to this day with the onset of the Delta variant. In mid-March 2020, the university was required to transition over 5,000 courses from on-ground and in-person to remote and online program in a matter of two weeks, forcing us to close the campus for an extended period. Our employees, with the excep uh, exception of essential staff, were sent home to work remotely. Students, as well as the majority of our employees, remained off campus working and attending remotely for more than 16 months. With great dedication to university employees, we continue to operate and function, ladies and gentlemen, under these very severe challenges. You should know that because of the demographics of our student body, low income, Pell eligible, first generation, we felt it was important for the university to continue to pay all of our student workers during the shutdown, even though they were not working due to the pandemic. Does that sound like a university on decline? Again, because of the composition of our student population, many students, including large contingent of international students who were living in our residence hall, had no home or no place to go. Unlike other institutions that totally closed their residence down, we did not do that. We kept one of our residence hall open to accommodate them and provide services for them during the shutdown period. And then when the university reopened for campus in-person classes during fall 2020 and 2021, we were the only university, one of the few university in the fall of 20 and spring of 21 to see an increase in our enrollment. 
That's the data. The university continues to operate with the challenges of the pandemic. And I could not be more proud of our students, our faculty, our staff, as they take on these enormous difficulties head on with determination. And I believe, members of the board, that our faculty, our staff, deserve some recognition for their resilience and their dedication. I got a good bit of, of letters about why we shouldn't open up the university. The staff and the faculty put their efforts together. We open up the university and they're doing outstanding work during this period uh, on, in the history of our university. Mr. Chairman, I have, I was going to update the board on uh, the uh, aviation matter, but in light of the time, um, I will send out uh, a note that will give you the latest. Uh, the bottom line is the university is working diligently to address the issues that the city has raised. We have in 2020 develop a strategic plan that the city participated in, the airport commission uh, participated in, that projected this growth, that projected the facilities needed. And in a moment, I will be giving you a copy of that plan that has the deputy city manager signature on that plan. However, the issue now is that they feel that our program has grown too large. They've asked me to cut our enrollment in our pro-pilot program. I refuse. The city has no rights to determine the enrollment of the university. We're in the process now of exploring various options. And we're in discussion, in a very serious discussion, with the site that I will be announcing very shortly, the chairman and I and uh, Pete DeLay, we've been working for a number of weeks now, along with our faculty and our staff. I see our interim dean is here and our new chair. We are developing a three-phase plan uh, with an immediate step, um, uh, a long-term step, well, short-term, immediate, and long-term. And once that is completed, I'll be sharing that with the board. But the city has made it very clear that uh, they cannot and would not uh, accommodate a pilot program as it continues to grow. Our goal is to create, we already a top five aviation program. Our goal is to create and sustain a world class, a world class aviation academy. And so in closing, in closing, I want to thank you as board members for the support that you have given us in some very difficult times. You have been with us as we struggle with this pandemic. We, pro, uh, we bring our policies to you. We really appreciate all that you do to make this university what it is today. Thank you so much. Th thank you, uh, Mr. President. It's uh, um, following you. Uh, they say the uh, the old saying on the Grand Ole Opry was, "You never wanted to follow Charlie Daniels." So uh, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. I'm really excited about where we're going. I think we have. I'm sorry. I left out the secretary's report. First mistake I've ever made, James. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, I'm reporting that minor technical revisions have been made to the following board policies. Reservation and delegation of authority and board committees. The edits were made to update Brenda Burkhart's title from Director of Audit and Consulting Services to Chief Audit Executive. Uh, these revisions occurred on August the 4th, 2021. I have nothing further to report.
Does that conclude your report? Yes, sir. Thank you. And so I'll give my remarks in there close. I'm excited about where we're going. I think we have three or four game-changing events that are likely to happen in the next 18 months or two years. I want to applaud the president and the staff, and I don't mean, I'm not demeaning anybody by saying staff, I'm talking about everybody that works here for getting through the COVID uh, or get so far on, on the track. We led the state in opening and set the standard. One of the things I'm particularly pleased that we didn't close our dorms. Christine, there was no place for many of them to go. I mean, that's what kind of student body we have. There's no place for them to go. So it was really, it's, it's fine for Vanderbilt to close their dorms. But if we had done that, there'd have been hundreds of homeless people. So we're, it, it, that's, a, that's just a little known fact that we, uh, we, we don't get enough credit for. I'm excited and appreciative of your trust and uh, and being the chairman, and I can tell you, I'm borrowing from Central Alexander. Most every day I think about ways to, to make the university better. And most nights when I go to sleep, I, I, I feel pretty good that I advanced the ball. So uh, working with the great staff we have here, and as Trustee Freeman said, we're on the right corner. We should do well, and I expect us to do well. And I think the, um, the future is super bright, and I appreciate being part of it. And thanks for all, all your service. And I'm going to recommend to President Biden that they double our pay <laughs> at the earliest convenience, perhaps in the infrastructure bill. <laughs> the motion, is, uh, the, uh, our meeting is now adjourned. Mr. Chairman, quick, quick question. Can we get uh, President F Dr. McPhee, could you give us an update on the fall enrollment? We talked a little bit about it last and committee meetings, what are, what's our current numbers for the fall? We will get that number, I think the 14th day now our census uh, just came in and we are, so we'll get that to you. That is not official. It's, you but send that to us as soon as Yeah, we'll send that. All right, thank but you. every university has had a decline uh, in this fall. Um, our meeting is adjourned and thank, thank you. you very much. Oh. And I'm not sure one cookie's gonna be enough. I know, but I don't know. Yeah. Did we get a K-1? Yeah.